Hello everyone, bringing you part two today in a series of videos which are looking at initial issue 1937 pattern web equipment. Obviously we looked at the mannequin and the equipment set up on the mannequin in part one. In this video we're going to be taking a look at the various components of early issue 1937 pattern web equipment in more detail. So the first component we'll look at here in more detail is the belt from the 1937 pattern web equipment. This is actually a 1950s dated example and I did mention some of the components we will look at will be quite late dated. That's because some components return back to the initial standards for production. Some of the changes introduced into 1937 pattern manufacture during the war were for reasons of economy, reasons of companies being brought in who couldn't manufacture components to the initial design. But as said, many of the components would return back to their initial production post Second World War when production started up again. And the belt is an example of that. When first introduced, the list of changes entry for the introduction of 1937 pattern mentions two sizes small and large, but by 1939 there is mention also made of an extra large, and these three sizes correspond to a length of 44, 50 and 56 inches respectively. So we'll talk about changes in this initial issue within the first couple of years of 1937 pattern being introduced like pre-Second World War essentially. So three different sizes of belt. This is an example of the initial manufacture. You can see we have pockets woven into the rear here, and these allow for the adjustment of the belt as you can see on each side. It doubles back on itself. These are also used to locate the C hooks on the back of the equipment, which means that the pouches and so forth attached to the belt don't slide around. They are captive. You have the 1919 patent buckle there, as you can see. A classic design from Mills used on many different sets of equipment and obviously still used by the British Army today. And then to the rear, we have the buckles for attaching the braces. And this particular example is a Miko 1950s production belt, as you can see there. Just underneath, and you can see the contract number underneath as well. So that's the belt. Uh, simple functional design, um, I'd say based on previous interwar uh, web equipment sets. Uh, the system with the belt doubling back on itself to adjust and so forth is used as part of a drill belt, part of the 1925 pattern. RAF equipment and then obviously just the addition of the buckles on the back essentially you have the 1937 pattern belt design so it's an incremental development from interwar designs of web equipment. The next thing we'll take a look at here are the braces and I have these laid out here to show you quite clearly how they cross over. This is according to the fitting instructions and according to the, the nomenclature for these the left hand brace is the one with the loop which we can see here that has the loop attached to it. So for initial production, initial introduction of the braces for the equipment, they do have a loop, but this would disappear later on as we'll get to in future videos. Just take this apart here. You can see more detail of the loop on the back there. The right hand brace passes through that. Uh, you do see them worn the other way around in, in period photographs, but that's the way the fitting instructions say it should be, and that's the nomenclature is left and right. These particular examples, uh, we'll have a look at the stamps on the back here. We have MWNS, as you can see there, and not entirely clear the date there, but 1940-something. The other one, I think, is a little more clear. Yeah, this is a Miko example from 1940. And these are made using what's referred to as reduction weaving. So you have a reduction woven construction, which means that uh, through, through the weaving process, the two-inch section over the shoulder next down to one inch here, the loose end tucked away in there. So it's a, a very neat way of doing things. This would change, well, it changed, you'd still see a reduction woven uh, manufacture into the Second World War. But as new companies uh, were introduced to webbing manufacture, carpet manufacturers, uh, upholsterers for car firms, that sort of thing, you'd see changes to this because they did not have the equipment to achieve this reduction weaving uh, method of manufacturing the braces. So you see them with them stitched on and folded over and all sorts of different ways of getting the one inch strap to marry up to the, the two inch strap. So we'll look at that in future videos, but this is the initial production method with the reduction weaving, and you can see both Miko and MWNS used that method for manufacturing the braces. These were manufactured initially uh, in one size. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the, the second issue video further on in the series. By 1940, you're seeing these marked normal because a long form of the braces was introduced. It was found that the, the standard size as introduced, which is now normal marked here in 1940, was actually too short. But we'll talk about that more 
when we get on to looking at the second issue, 1937 pattern, if you can consider it that. It's a little difficult to portion off 1937 pattern into different sort of issues. We're looking at initial issue here, so I'll talk about the, the changes that were wrought a little bit later on in the next part in this series. So the next component we'll talk about here are the basic pouches, and this is a move away from previous web equipment sets which had used cartridge carriers. Cartridge carriers were of course provided for 1937 pattern and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later on in, a, in another video. The basic pouches were intended for carrying not only the rifle ammunition, and grenades and so forth of an instrument, but also the magazines for both the Bren light machine gun and of course the boys anti-tank rifle which had been introduced into the British Army in the late 1930s. Cartridge carriers of course do not cut it as far as those two weapons are concerned, so you need something entirely new. We have four pouches here, two pairs. The reason for that is, these are all Mark 1s. The reason for the two sets is that there's a very small change which is not immediately apparent in Mark 1 production between its introduction, 1937, and then manufacture in 1938, and then the change occurs somewhere between 1938 and 1939, as we'll see as we look at these pouches here. These are the very first design, the very first production, and you can see have a, a date of, well, the stamp of Miko, and then 1938. If you can get the light on there, it does show up 1938 there. The major change in production is that this has a, a feature which the later ones don't, which are these loops in the lid here for carrying ballastite blanks for firing rifle grenades. These were very rapidly deleted from the design, as we'll see. So we have a 1938 production pouch here. You can see the design on the back here, a very distinctive feature of Mark 1s is just how high the sea hooks are sat up on the back of the, the pouch there, as you can see. About an inch gap for where the buckle is attached at the top here and the, the webbing attaching the sea hooks to the rear there, as you can see. So, put that to one side, just have another example here. Slightly more clearly marked, if I remember, it does have an ink stain over it, but you can see the 1938 a little more clearly there. And again, the loops under the flap there. So, that's a pair of the, the very initial issue um, so these were also manufactured in 1937. There are 1937 dated examples out there. Uh, there's a, photographs of them on Khaki Web, which is a, a website I'll probably mention again. That's linked down below in a pinned comment, which I highly recommend you going and having a look at. Move on now to what are a pair of 1939 dated examples. I can get the... Come here, you. This is a, a stiff one. There we go. The, uh, the, the press stood there. I don't know if we'll be able to see, but this is MWNS Limited. And it is, you can just see the nine there, it is 1939. Uh, this has, as you can see on the back here, exactly the same placement of the, the sea hooks and everything on the back there. It is a Mark I still, it didn't move forward in, in Mark designation, but we've lost the ballastite loops out of the flap there. This one might have a slightly clearer stamp in it, if I remember. Oh no, that's even worse. <laughs> Never mind, I'm misremembering. But yes, so two different versions of Mark I there. The, the pair here with the loops in the flap and the pair here without. That's a very early change that took place. It doesn't represent a change in the mark designation of the pouches, so I've included both here. Uh, but these are, say, 1939 dated and these 1938 dated, so it occurred somewhere between those two dates. Something to mention here, just a point of clarification. I mentioned the ballastite loops being removed from the design of the pouches. This is true of British production, however, pouches produced later on in the Empire and the Commonwealth often included this part of the design. It wasn't deleted from all countries' manufacture of 1937 pattern. So there we are, that's the Mark I basic pouches. As I say, we'll look at cartridge carriers, which are somewhat different kettle of fish in a future video. So the next thing to have a look at here is the bayonet frog. And as you can see here, uh, this is a fairly simple design. Uh, in addition to previous designs seen in British Army use is the loop to secure the, uh, the handle of the bayonet there. Um, obviously, that had been introduced on other sets of web equipment in the interwar period as well. Bayonet frog designs of basically this form had been used with other sets of web equipment as well. This was nothing new, just new to British Army use. And obviously, simple loops here. The British bayonets have a stud, so you put the stud through the middle there, and it holds the scabbard down through here. Designed to take the sword bayonet for the rifle number one Mark III Star, of course, which was still the standard British Army rifle when 1937 pattern was introduced. So, a very simple design sits on a belt loop there, and uh, this was the initial design. It would have to be modified later on, of course, to take the spike bayonet for the rifle number four, but we'll talk about that in future videos. So a very simple design, the initial 
1937 pattern bayonet frog there. Moving on from the various items meant to be attached to the belt, we'll now have a look at the haversack, which of course is primarily meant to be carried on the back using the L straps, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. This is quite an advance on the design of the 1908 pattern haversack. It's a lot larger. It's designed to carry a, a much bulkier sort of subsistence load on the back. And from that point of view, it's a, a step forward in design. As already said, designed to carry both the water bottle internally and a new design of oblong mess tins. The previous D-shaped mess tins, of course, had had to be carried attached to the 1908 haversack when the equipment was worn in battle order, which left them prone to damage. So carrying them inside the haversack has various advantages. It's a bit more ergonomic than not swinging around suspended below, and as a result, they aren't prone to damage in that regard. We'll have a look at the internal stowage in just a minute. We'll have a look at the outside features here. Two narrow straps down the front here with buckles to secure the flap there. Quite a lot of adjustment here, depending on how heavily loaded this is. You can adjust them right up if you're carrying things folded under the, the flap of the haversack, and that was definitely a feature used later on when carrying the, the ground sheet rolled up or the gas cape rolled up underneath the flap. This can be carried on the brace ends when the equipment's worn in marching order, but primarily it's designed to be carried uh, on the back using L straps, which attach onto the two inch straps at the top here, and then buckle onto these buckles at the base here, as you can see. It does have these buckles though. Still, it can be carried on the hip when the equipment's worn in marching order. So you still have that concession there to wearing a, a, an equi set of equipment for changing stations and that sort of thing when you need to carry a, a lot more kit than be, can be carried in battle order. We open this up here and have a look underneath the flap. You can see this is another 1940 dated component, Miko manufactured. You can see there, nice and clear. And then, Inside, we can see there's one large rear compartment here, and this would take soft kit. The idea provides some padding against your back, so your cardigan, and cap comforter and so forth in there to provide padding against the, the, the back. And then we have two components in the front here, one of which will hold the water bottle and the other of which will hold the mess tins nested together. So that's the initial design idea behind this anyway, and quite an advance on the 1908 have a sack in that regard. Uh, obviously, the, the compartments themselves made of this uh, thinner canvas material as opposed to um, being made of webbing uh, as the rest of the haversack is but that's the the internal layout so that's the haversack from the equipment the next component to look at here are the l straps and these of course are used to carry the haversack on the back or the 1908 pack on the back as needed this is an advance on the 1908 pattern equipment in some regards but though that equipment with having the pack or the haversack buckled directly on meant it was very balanced and it held together as one piece. You couldn't dump the pack or the haversack without removing the entire equipment and, and taking it off and buckling it. These buckles attach to the 1908 braces directly, and that means that the pack and the haversack are buckled directly onto the equipment and form part of it. Whereas here, you have the separate set of straps, which means that the haversack or the pack can be removed without removing the rest of the equipment. The way this functions, of course, is when these are attached and worn as shoulder straps, the Buckles on the basic pouches and indeed cartridge carriers and other components, such as the brace attachments. The strap from the brace passes through this lower set of the buckle, this lower part of the buckle. And this upper loop here takes the hook from the L straps and the equipment hooks together that way. Quite a neat design in that regard. Nothing new, something that had existed in previous designs in the interwar period, but a new departure for the British Army in using this system. The L-straps in this instance are both 50s examples, as I remember. Now that has the remnants of a, a contract number there. This one, I think, has a 50s date on it. Yes, you can see there. So another example, this is MWS again. Another example of 50s components manufactured to initial specification. Most of the changes that would come with these during the war were similar to the braces in modifications to manufacture to allow other companies to make them without this reduction woven section here which is the same as we saw on the braces, and also economy of components, so using different metals for the fittings and so forth. Some of these were also manufactured in canvas as well. That's something we'll discuss further in future videos. The way these work, if I bring the haversack back in here, we have the buckle here is free to move. This is the same buckle as used with the braces from the 1908 equipment. And you simply pass the strap the back of the haversack through there, as you can see. And then this strap simply comes around and buckles onto the 
buckle at the bottom there. And then we have the L-strap or one of the L-straps attached. And you'd simply do the, the mirror image on the other side. This then loops around and as I already shown, hooks into the basic pouch at the front of the equipment. So that's how this system works. So the next thing we'll look at here is the water bottle carrier. And as already said, this is not intended to be used with 1937 pattern all the time. It's primarily designed in its initial sort of in the initial concepts with the initial concepts behind the design this would be used with marching order with the water bottle being carried in the haversack when the equipment was worn in battle order obviously that would very rapidly change and the water bottle carrier would become a commonly used part of the equipment to carry the water bottle on the hip and allow more room in the haversack to carry various other items but as initially designed this is intended primarily to be used with the equipment when it's carried in battle order when it's worn in battle order so that the water bottle can be removed from the haversack and carried down on the hip. This is the initial design, skeleton type as it's often referred to, with the press stud closing up on the shoulder of the bottle. So you have two straps with the female and the male part of the press stud on them. You don't have an initial design that comes around. There's a still quite a common mis misconception with this, with the press stud on the front, which loops over. There is a design of that nature in khaki uh, webbing, which is the 1919 pattern, obviously during the war Canada would start manufacturing 1937 pattern water bottles that way as well. But British skeleton type water bottle carriers basically function in this manner with the press studs on the shoulder of the bottle. As production progressed, of course, you'd then have the sleeve type appear. Uh, but the initial issue is this design. This particular example is dated 1940 and you can see it's manufactured by, we can just see the base of the B there, BHG 1940. The 1940s nice and clear, but obviously this has been stamped uh, at an angle on this piece of webbing so we've lost a uh, part of the uh, manufacturer there but bringing a new manufacturer in we haven't seen this yet and this is uh, an example of different companies being brought into manufacture webbing at the start of the second world war to meet demand the final component we'll look at here is not actually part of the 1937 pattern web equipment that's been mentioned already this is the 1908 pack which was intended to be used with 1937 pattern it will be quite a few years before the pack was re-patterned as 1937 pattern. The pack itself, a very simple design, one big open compartment. We're not only looking at the pack here as well, we have the supporting straps. You can see these are Miko 1940 dated. The pack is 1940 dated as well, as we'll see in a minute. And of course, the way this works, it looks looking at the front of the pack here, the straps, the supporting straps loop through these loops on the bottom, cross over at the front, they can, of course, be used to carry a helmet and so forth in this position if need be. They don't have to, of course. They can just be used to support the pack. They then buckle onto these buckles at the top here. I'll just buckle one through there to show you. And that means that you have buckles at the bottom here, as you can see, and then the two inch straps at the top here, which mean that you can attach the L straps. Of course, originally these would buckle directly onto 1908 pattern equipment but these are equally com compatible with the L-straps, which we've looked at previously, and function in exactly the same way as they do with the haversack. So in that way, the 1908 pack can be carried on the back with the 1937 pattern web equipment, and is fully compatible with it from that point of view. Just flip this back over again. I shall just unbuckle this first. Unbuckle the front here, and we can have a very quick look inside. There's not a lot to see. It is just one big open compartment, as I said already. We can have a look at the date under the flap here. You can see 1940 quite clearly there. This is M, W and S. I don't know if you can see that clearly there, but it is It is there. If we look inside one big open compartment, as you can see there. It's carrying the great coat and various other items. Obviously used in some theatres to carry other kit as well, but that's perhaps something we'll discuss in a future video. I have made a video previously looking at the, the modified Shindit pack, which is one example of how 1937 pattern was not adequate for all loads required to be carried during the Second World War and the pack would have to be worn in, in a, uh, a more general role than it had originally been intended for. But that's the pack and as I say this is technically along with the supporting straps still part of the 1908 pattern web equipment but is fully compatible with the 1937 pattern equipment. So there we are, I hope you found it interesting looking at the various components here in more detail. Next part we'll probably be looking at pistol equipment, that's the intention in part three. If you'd like to see that and the other videos I upload going forward, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, little notification button down below 
That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can. There's both PayPal and Patreon linked down below. And a massive thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those methods. It really is very much appreciated, as I always say. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to make contact but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.